This is Financial Standard, the definitive source of news, thought leadership and analysis for Australian wealth management professionals. Financial Standard. Take the lead. I'm Cassandra Baldini with Financial Standard. The risks of cyber warfare is steadily increasing in Australia. Last year, attacks jumped by 13%, while a rise in the average cost per crime also shot up across small, medium and large businesses. NGS Super and Latitude Financial Services were the latest to fall prey, both suffering cyber attacks, which led to data breaches. As these crimes continue to get more and more sophisticated, both the government and industry are working to combat them. However, the likelihood of more breaches remains high. Here with me today to discuss this further is Horizon Government Relations Managing Partner, Carl Unger. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Cassandra. Good to be with you. There are various types of cybercrimes, and what we're talking about today pertains to organised and sophisticated syndicates that mainly target medium to larger businesses. Can you explain to us where these attacks are mainly coming from and who is behind them? Yes, Cassandra. So we have seen uh, a genuine uptick in the role that cyber criminals are playing attacking Australia uh, and other uh, countries, mostly uh, the United States and in Europe. But in the case of Australia, we know that there are around two dozen organised cyber criminal groups that operate. Um, most of them operate out of Eastern Europe uh, and linked to Russia and a smaller number out of places like Iran and in Asia, in North Korea and in China. So we, we know generally the broader strategic challenge of the cyber criminal networks. Uh, what we haven't yet been able to do is to stop them. Can you explain to us, these cyber criminals going after these big organisations, they're looking to monetize the data stolen, right, as opposed to directly impact the company itself? It, it's partly both, Cassandra. So we saw in, say, the Optus and the Medibank private uh, breaches of late last year, there were direct ransomware payments made against the companies themselves in the case of Optus up to $10 million. And in Medibank, uh, the Medibank board decided not to pay the ransom. So we will we will not know what that is. But Nonetheless, um, yes, there is a direct ransomware ask at times, but at the same time, these groups are packaging up the data and using what's called ransomware as a service. So they literally package up data and on-sell that to other organised criminal groups for them to exploit. So it might be um, private information such as your passport or your licence or other financial data that is then used to um, you know, try and uh, conduct fraud or theft against individuals. So there's two sides of this going on simultaneously. So there's different things happening um, to data after it's compromised. Can you maybe walk us through what's happening to data that's compromised from, say, a super fund? Right. So we know that the financial services sector uh, is heavily targeted because uh, the cyber criminals want to go after the money, right? So they just they are looking for organisations that hold um, lots of data sets of individuals who potentially have a high net wealth uh, value for them, and financial services companies, banks, legal firms, and others are often targeted in, and superannuation funds are often targeted because of that reason. What happens, you know, the, the latitude case of the last two weeks, I think, is quite instructive in this uh, way. The, the original advice from Latitude was that perhaps a hundred to 200,000 uh, records of individuals who've used their financial services were breached. We now know it's up to 14 million. Um, and so that was through a fairly sophisticated but not uncommon uh, access to um, someone's authorization through an email chain and once they've got access through, uh, in this case, a third party to an email access, they were able to extrap you know, extract all of this data from Latitude's databases. And so what happens then is that data is then often transferred to servers that are known to be, uh, you know, uh, less uh, accessible to Western intelligence agencies. 
uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, and from there the data gets packaged up as met, you know as, as packages and on sold to other criminal groups for fraud. Sometimes that fraud then gets perpetrated back in Australia in in terms of our large uh, uh, government services programs such as Medicare or uh, the NDIS programs, and uh, fraud is committed that way uh, on on major government institutions. And do you think Australia is becoming more of a target for such crimes? And if so, why? Where do we sit when compared to our global counterparts? Australia is about uh, 5% of global ransomware attacks, which is interesting, which is commensurate with the size of our uh, population relative to the rest of the world. So we're sort of in the middle, if you like. 30% of all global ransomware attacks occur in the United States, but they're just about to be overtaken by the European Union and much of that has to do with the war in Ukraine as some of these Eastern European criminal groups linked to Russia seek to um, basically offer services to, in defence of national strategic goals, if you like. So um, Europe is rapidly rising up the list of areas that are regions that are being attacked from these criminal gangs. So um, Australia is about 5%. The, the number it seems to be increasing because we've had such high-profile cases over the last six months. The fact is that, uh, that it, it's not increasing that much. Um, and in some ways, we are slightly protected because, um, ironically, it's the time zone differences. So when Australia is waking up and business is being done, you know, Russia's often going to sleep. So <laughs> uh, there's, there's actually uh, some some benefit to the tyranny of distance that we have. Well, no doubt that both individuals and businesses are becoming savvier as these attacks ramp up. But can you tell me what's being done behind the scenes by the government and industry to stop these criminals? So you will have heard the incoming Labor government and the Minister, Claire O'Neill, the Minister for Cybersecurity. So there's there's a couple of things there. One, cybersecurity has been uh, directly elevated to a cabinet-level position which is a very important thing and and now very much concentrated in the Department of Home Affairs. Um, You saw at the time of the Optus and Medibank private breaches that the minister was furious at one and and less so against another because there is a real sense that some of these large organisations that hold mega data sets have not done enough to protect the privacy of individual Australians and so what we're seeing now is privacy legislation. The Attorney General has just proposed to bring new privacy legislation through the federal parliament, which will really stiffen up um, the requirements on companies and boards and CEOs to make sure that they have their risk mitigation processes absolutely locked tight in terms of the data that they hold. Data used to be, Cassandra, data used to be considered gold uh, because it was something that companies like to collect and then they could use it for their own purposes. I think everyone is starting to realise that data is now kryptonite (laughs) and that it should be treated with, uh, you know, much more respect in terms of the vulnerability that brings to certain companies. But in terms of what the federal government's doing, they've just announced last week some significant machinery of government changes, which will stand up an Office of National Cybersecurity in the Department of Home Affairs. That's going to be a coordinating mechanism across all of the intelligence and policy departments to try and bring a whole of government effort against these cyber criminals who are targeting Australia. The Minister, Claire O'Neill, has said she wants Australia to be the safest, in terms of cyber security, the safest country in the world. That's an ambition that I think we all have, uh, but I think it's a huge task for all of us to get on board with. And APRA specifically warned super funds of the need to increase their security against tax. Why do you think super funds are so appealing to these criminals? And what should they be doing to intercept these crimes or prevent them altogether? So superannuation funds and other financial services industries are vulnerable because the data that is held is data of individual accounts and money that gets transferred in large sways uh, at the time. You know, so this is where um, the digitization of the financial services industry is actually, although important, it's also a risk. And the risk is that 
in the transfer of large data or large amounts of money is the vulnerability that cyber criminals look for um, and super fund, large super funds, particularly when they're funding large infrastructure projects and that sort of thing, are transferring millions, if not billions of dollars at a time to fund these sorts of things. And that is the vulnerability that uh, they see. So APRA and ASIC uh, at the October budget last year, the federal government down brought down a, um, an element within that budget to stiffen up uh, all of the um, – there was increased government funding for f- uh, financial services regulation, so that includes APRA and ASIC. And ASIC uh, had its first successful prosecution of a financial services company last year with uh, RR, RI advice even though in the end it was just a matter of them paying costs. But the the ASIC bringing a federal court case against a financial services company for inadequate cybersecurity risk management practices was an important uh, crossing of the Rubicon in the way in which regulation is going to occur in this country. And what, what we're going to see is much more uh, regulation of the financial services industry and potentially more prosecutions if these companies do not uh, now move to really stiffen up their risk, cybersecurity risk management frameworks. Finally, do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? Well, it's interesting, Cassandra. I mean, you know, the um, even over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've saw, saw the global banking industry in somewhat of a precarious position with uh, Credit Suisse and others. Uh, and in the United States sort of uh, teetering. And and while I don't think that the uh, global uh, financial services sector is in the same place as we were during the GFC, I I do think the whole digitisation agenda that has occurred over the last 10 or 15 years has created more vulnerabilities. And what I think that means is that the financial industry has to be far more attuned, as I said before, to the nature of the data they hold, the vulnerabilities that it causes and how they put in place risk mitigation strategies. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing those insights. Thanks, Cassandra. Good to be with you. Thanks for listening to this Financial Standard podcast. For more information, visit financialstandard.com.au. Please keep in mind that the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider personal circumstances. Reliance should not be placed on any content without further independent financial research and advice.